On the other side of the Beck, and on the opposite side of Whitby Bridge, we have Newby Mill. Hardly any Scarborians know that this mill existed. There is nothing left standing to show where it was and little, or no information, about it. As you can see, it had by far the best supply of running water, the mill wheel and building stood right next to this wheel. Looking at the area you would never have imagined that a very busy, and important, corn mill stood on the site. The buildings were demolished in the late 1940s. Nothing left to show what was there, or the lives of the people who worked the mill, until now. Steve has spent countless hours searching through these old trade directories. Trying to find out who lived and worked, in all the corn mills featured in this video. Eventually a pattern emerged and one name stood out, Thomas Flinton. Hi there! Well, I'm back down here, on the side of the beck, and over there is what was Newby Mill. This is my auto cue. it's a big budget production, so if you see me waving this about, it's my script. On that patch of land, just over there, stood what was probably the last working car mill in Scarborough. Newby Mill. It was back in 2022 when I started to research this mill. The only bit of information I had was this photo, nothing else. The text that came with the photo said, Newby Mill, Scorby Road. Everybody I spoke to says, that's the mill next to the bridge near the Rosette pub. That bridge is way upstream, that way. So let's go take a look. Should have come Sunday morning. This is where most folks say the mill was. We have the beck, a building and a bridge. Plus the text on the photo saying Scorby Road. Oh, and there's an old millstone just over there. Oh, this is Scarby Road. Move it round. And just up there is the Rosette Pub. And then to Newby. Of course, the Beck is the boundary between Newby and Scorby. So where is the mill? Well, have a look over there. So now I'm on the Newby side of the Beck. And over there, the mill should be there, if you believe that photograph. Well, you can see the mill building, and you can see the bridge. But nothing matches up. Perhaps this mill was here, and then pulled down and replaced with this cottage. Well, let's have a look and see what really happened. There's the bridge, by the way. And again, there's no arches on that bridge. There never was. And that certainly didn't match up. I have maps of the area that date back to 1725. And there is no water mill shown in this location on any of the maps. There may well have been one way back in time, but not for at least 300 years. So why does this photo state that a mill is on Scarby Road? This is Scarby Road, so where is the mill? Again, to work that out, we need to study the old maps. Today, this is the junction between Scorby Road and Falsgrave Road. In 1852, it looked like this. This road is called North Street, no mention of Scorby Road. Further along, the name changes to New Lane. Access to the south side of Scorby Village was via this lane. On the 1892 map, the old North Road is now named Scorby Road. Eventually, all the old lane was developed into the major road that we see today, Scorby Road. So during the early mid-1800s, this road was not called Scorby Road. Okay, so why does the photo state Scorby Road? Surely it should say New Lane. Before 1900, Scorby Road was actually the road that we call the A165 today. Part of it is Burniston Road. It's way back that way. The coastal road, which should be popping back in a few minutes. That was the main road from Scarborough to Whitby via the villages of Burniston and Cloughton. A lot of the old maps also call it Whitby Road. Before we go back to the old Scorby Road, let's have a look at a few things that also confirm that this photo was not taken in this location. The bridge does not match up. The buildings certainly don't match up. 
There is no weir in front of this building. The water is running from right to left. The beck runs the opposite way. That's the way the beck runs. This tells us that the mill was actually on the south side of the beck. That's the side I'm stood on now. That side of the beck, that side of the beck is Scorby, and this bank where I'm on now is Newby. Sorted, this is not the location of the Newby mill. So let's knit back to the other bridge. Right, I'm back again. Now then, that road over there where the bridge is, is year 165. At this point it's also called Burniston Road. As already mentioned, its starting life has been called Scorby Road and Whitby Road. This is the real reason why the photo states Scorby Road. Now it becomes very easy to match up the photo with this location. We have the bridge over there. Notice that the arches all match up. And then there is this gate and path that leads down to where the old mill was. And then of course we've got the weir. Know which way the water's flowing. Fantastic water flow down here. We spent a lot of time trying to work out when this mill would have been built and so far we've not been able to pin it down to a date. We think it was built not long after the sea cut was completed. That work was done in 1804. The sea cut diverted water from the Derwent into the Beck. This stopped flooding further upstream and greatly improved the water flow along the Beck as you can see. All the existing core mills took advantage of this extra water flow. This one, over there, was the only one that was put right next to the water flow. The water was taken off about where the bridge is and returned near the bottom of the weir. This is why we think this mill was built sometime after 1804. Custom built to take advantage of the new water flow. One interesting fact that we found was this land in this area was once owned by George Osbaldiston, a skilled sportsman, gambler and MP for Scarborough. He got seriously into debt. How dare you, sir? It is all lies. And sold most of his land. I have to climb back of a bloody fence again. I'm going to end up in that book, I tell you. Looking at that bit of land over there, it's hard to believe that there's been a long and interesting history. The full story of the mill and the family that lived there would no doubt make a great period drama. I figured out the history of everyone who lived there, but for the purpose of this video, I shall just be detailing the main points. I have a number of trade directories that date back to 1837. Most of these directories only really concern Scarborough, it's not often that you find anything associated with Newby and Scorby. However, I started to search for corn millers, and one name that came up a couple of times was Thomas Flinton. So I now knew that Thomas Flinton was the miller running this mill. But for how long? To solve that problem, I ended up searching ancestry records. Starting with Thomas, from there, from when he was born, to when he died, aged 80. I should have brought a bigger tripod or a stool. Anyway, the Flinton family were the only family to ever run this mill. They moved in around 1836 and were still there until the mill closed 100 years later in 1936. The story starts at Burton Fleming with William Flinton. His father was a farmer who worked the farm in Burton Fleming, which is about 20 miles that way. William's father died in 1827. He was only 48 years old. When his father died, William was just 21 years old. Over the next six years, we don't really know where William was working or living. We do know that he married 1st of June, 1833, 
at Clowton. He married a girl called Jane Jefferson. Clowton's back that way. That way, not in the sky. Now it could well be that he was already living at the mill when he got married, although we're not sure of that. Now we do know that their daughter Jane was the first of many Flintons to be born at the mill. It was October 1837. Later in 1840, son Thomas was born. It will be Thomas that we will be following. Excluding workers and servants, in 1841 there were now four of the Flinton family living at the mill. The two children were the start of many more people born at the mill. William and Jane eventually had six children. The second oldest, of course, was Thomas. Now one thing that we have not been able to establish is who owned this mill. We would like to think that William bought the land and had the mill built, but this does seem very unlikely. Okay, Thomas. When Thomas grew up, he eventually took over running of the mill. He married Annie Stonehouse in 1861. A year later, it seems that Annie died while giving birth to their daughter, Annie Stonehouse Linton. Five years later, in 1869, Thomas remarried. He married Christina Blaine. They went on to have nine children, and I believe at least one of them died young. I did follow the fortunes of all the children and found an awful lot of interesting family history there. However, I'm just going to deal with the last few that were born here. Israel Gilbert, born in 1884, and Frank Jefferson, born in 1887. Both of these men were the youngest children of Thomas and Christine. All of their children were also born at the mill. Israel Gilbert is important to the story because he was the last person to run this mill as a miller. This is Israel enjoying his retirement. His younger brother Frank went on to be a joiner and he was working for Scarborough Council in the mid-1930s as a joiner and it looks like he was employed on the building of the original open air theatre. It's supposed to be sunny today, my hands are freezing. Israel Gilbert married Elizabeth Matilda Stacy, July 1911. They had six children, again all of them were born at the mill. It was Ethel Stacy, Gilbert G, Walter, Kathleen, Ronald and Neville. This is a picture of Israel and Elizabeth, far left at the wedding of their son Walter. The first Flinton born at the mill was Jane in 1837. Walter was the second to last person to be born there in January 1920 and the very last with his brother Neville in 1927. So over 100 years, four generations of the same family worked and lived in this mill building. There were at least 25 births, probably a lot more. Thomas died in 1920 and probate records show that he left £2,000 that went to two farmers, Hopper and Lang. Earlier I mentioned that uh, we couldn't find any information to say whether the Flintons owned this mill or not. It would be nice to think that they bought it from the start and had the mill built, but it seems very unlikely. You see, after Thomas died, with him leaving probate to Hopper and Lang, if they had on the mill, it would have probably gone to Israel, who was still working the mill. Uh, the Flintons eventually moved out of the mill, probably around 1935, 1936. And in the next few years, the mill went into decline. Um, I understand it was pulled down probably 1959, but I'm not exactly sure of that neither. Whenever it was pulled down, clearly there's nothing left of it, not a thing. Right, I'm just going over to the side of the river because I want to have a look at something. I'll leave the camera going, hope nobody nicks it. This little path was the only access to the mill. Can you imagine shy horses coming down here, the carts taking all the stuff to the mill building. Round about here was a barn which you can see on the old photograph. And as you walk down here, it seems there was some sort of little building here, maybe a little stable or perhaps somewhere for pigs. This thing here is uh, something to do with Yorkshire water. Obviously that wasn't there then. 
come to the water's edge, was the miller's house. I'll move on a little bit more, and about here, the miller building itself would have stood. Quite tall up there, the mill wheel would have been inside the building. And as I've mentioned already, the water we're taking off from back there at the bridge, run down here somewhere, and back into the river. Run about here, you'll see some firemen. It's Scorby and Newby, um, probably volunteer firemen, doing some practicing. The mill was obviously nearly closed by then. You can't see me fire anything though, so I don't think, I think it was obviously just practicing. And that top window, you can see a, somebody looking out. It looks like a female. I would say, at a guess, that could well be Gilbert's wife, Elizabeth. In a matter of a year or so, uh, you see this picture. Now when the mill's in disrepair, half of it's missing, uh, the roof's gone, and the firemen have uh, got better equipment by the looks of it. And this is just before, I don't know, that, I think it's 1938 according to that uh, newspaper report and of course a year later World War II started but by now the Flintons had all moved out of the mill hard to imagine that been such a lot of history on this little bit of land right I shall make my way back the camera's still there nobody's pinched it now if you've been following this uh, video series from the start part one shows you huge flood in which that deck rose between 15 and 20 feet. Further upstream, that bridge we've just been to on, on, the, on the new Scorby Road was washed away. Uh, that mill behind us was severely damaged and probably never recovered and old Scorby Mill which is down that way was also really damaged. This one was left untouched and I think the reason why Again, it was probably built after the sea cup was made, purposely built to take advantage of the increased water flow. And you can see that over there, it's quite high up. But even so, could you imagine if you were living and working in that mill and 20 foot of water comes flying down here? It must have been pretty scary for the family living there. But they survived. The Flintons were still alive in... Um, 1935 when they moved out of the mill they didn't go that far actually quite a lot of them went up that way to Newby up by Moor Lane on that way and others of course have gone all over the place those that uh, eventually died like Israel they're all buried in St Lawrence's Church in Scorby Village it's a shame that this mill building was demolished and there's nothing left of it but hopefully now that we've put this video together the Flinton's time at the mill may never be forgotten. Just a couple of things before I move on. Big thanks to Ruth Flinton for the photographs and Leslie Newton for her help. Also for Mary for digging out them uh, fantastic photographs of the mill and my brother Colin for those newspaper reports. Well, before we do go wandering along to the end of the beck, I am adding this brief update to the info that we already have regarding Newby and Scorby Bridge mills. I've got a lot more dates from family trees and other sources that I have used to figure out the timelines for both these mills. Because there is a lot of data and it is also very boring to log all the connections, I am just going to keep it simple. We now have evidence that shows Scorby Bridge Mill was operating as far back as the mid 1600s. Various people owned the mill and land. In 1771 it was owned by John Robinson. In 1822 up to 1828 and maybe later the miller was Joseph Robinson who we believe was the son of John Robinson. Two more millers worked the mill up until 1857. 1857 was the year of the Great Flood and the mill was severely damaged. There are no records showing any miller from 1857. 
the mill is now shown as disused. The old buildings were later demolished. The replacement building never operated as a mill and it is today a small hotel and youth hostel. We know all about Newby Mill from 1837 onwards when William Flinton took it over. Before the sea cut was created in 1804 there is some evidence that there was a disused mill that we think was on the site of Newby Mill. The land that Newby Mill stood on was sold in 1818. We cannot be sure but it does seem that Newby Mill was either renovated or a new building built on the site after the sea cut was created. There are no records showing any miller before 1837. Both Newby and Scorby Bridge Mills were up and running between 1837 and 1857. When Scorby Bridge Mill closed for good in 1857, Newby Mill became the most important corn mill in the area. At some point during the late 1800s, Thomas Flinton became the owner of Newby Mill. The Flintons ran the mill for 100 years until it closed for good in 1938. Well now it's time to move on and we're going down to the old Scorby Mill which is back that way. That's the last one on the line. I may even bring back our two little cartoon characters to do the presenting because I'm getting wet and it's cold.